Good afternoon, everyone. So now, uh, today, we are going to start our uh, rural health care session in 58th APAN meeting. So welcome you all. Uh, I'm seeing many of our guests as well. Uh, to start with uh, Dr. Moriyama, uh, we'll start our introduction. We are here in Kathmandu Model Hospital. Uh, we are sharing this rural healthcare session regularly. Uh, and nice to see you all uh, in the in the screen. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Moriyama. So, will there be anyone in the uh, in Pakistan in host country? Now I'm in Japan. <laughs> oh. it, this is a restriction from our university hospital. We cannot <laughs> visit the Pakistan this time. So, unfortunately, it's a totally held online. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, there is no one in the hosting site. So we'll be the host, I think. And thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Dr. Uday Koirala, surgeon and also working in telemedicine and rural health for many years. And here we have our team. So please introduce. Hello, I'm Dr. S. Bhai Bangalore. Uh, hello, my name is Dr. Adesh Sunadi. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dr. Dhinwar Sarkar. Hello, my name is, I'm Rosin Sahib. Hello, good morning, everyone. So, uh, you please introduce yourself and uh, tell your name. So, starting from Dr. Yang from Korea. Dr. Yang? Yeah, actually, it's true, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, please introduce yourself. Oh yeah, I'm a heart surgeon working at Samsung Medical Center, Seoul, Korea. Uh, but my presentation is actually as a CEO of uh, my company for mental medicine, very, very small company. So thank you so much for having me. I uh, really enjoyed this session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chiang. Hello, uh, this is Ti Zhuang Chiang from National Taiwan University. I uh, is very glad to uh, join this session. Say hello to everyone from the seashore. Thank you, uh, Mr. Michael. Oh yeah, thank you. Good uh, good evening, everyone. Okay, I'm Michael Xu. I'm running a company called CUR Doctor, uh, Information Service Company, and also I founded a, a NPO called Wise Love, provide the uh, the public service, and. Uh, Glad to see meet with everybody and uh, uh, looking forward to hearing from you and the and the learning from you guys. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Doctor Dennis. Ah uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. No, this is uh, Doctor Dennis Batangan from the Philippines from the Ateneo de Manila University. Again, congratulations to APAN. 58 is it uh, I think it's 8.58 now and thanks to our uh, colleagues from Nepal for uh, always hosting this rural healthcare session. Uh, good you. day. Thank you uh, from Tendek. This time in the maybe only I join. Only I join from Tendek. Sorry, it's an almost an seven thirty p.m. Oh. Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yes. why now. Okay. okay. So how how one, Mister Powan? Powan Sake. Sumiko. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Powan Sake. I'm vice president of Telemedicine Society of Nepal. I'm sorry I couldn't turn on my video because I'm not in Kathmandu Valley and the place where I am is there is no proper network. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Razan. Razan. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from Nepal. I'm Razan Parajuri. Uh, I'm the director of Nepal Research and Education Networks and General Secretary of Telemedicine Society of Nepal. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Nirajan. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Nirajan Parajani. Uh, thank you. So, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. Thank you. Uh, uh, Ms. Savina. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Savina Kesi. Uh, from Kathmandu University, Nepal, and I'm currently pursuing Master's in Health Informatics at Kathmandu University. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone from QSU? QSU? No. Okay, uh, so now, uh, this time, uh, our title for the presentation uh, is uh, financing, health financing in rural healthcare. Actually, we wanted to discuss about how uh, this financing can be made possible in rural healthcare, especially in this uh, era of increasing healthcare cost. So Dr. Dennis will uh, start uh, with the presentation, community-based community health insurance in the Philippines. Uh, Dr. Dennis. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Baya. Can you, can you see my slides? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much no, for this uh, invitation. So for this particular uh, session, I will be presenting community-based health insurance uh, in the Philippines uh, to contribute to the topic on health financing on the APAN 58 uh, meeting on rural, uh, rural health care. So as earlier mentioned, I'm from the uh, Ateneo de Madrid University, working at the School of Social Sciences and the School of Government. Uh, as in, ter in, in terms of disclosures, I would just like to highlight some of the things that I am involved with and to, in to include that I have no conflict of interest in this presentation. So the outline of presentation will be three, three main areas, and I hope to be able to do this in the 10 minutes uh, allocated to me. First, of course, is the health system context in the Philippines uh, to provide a, an overview of the Philippine healthcare system. Second is healthcare financing, community-based health insurance. And uh, the third will be the role of community-based insurance in universal health care. Uh, just a, for a brief context, no, uh, the Philippines is a member of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. There are 10 ASEAN member states uh, inclu uh, uh, with, uh, with, with East Timor as the 11th, uh, but East Timor or Timor-Leste is still an observer status. We have a population of around 110 million in the Philippines, uh, around 7,000 uh, islands in uh, 15 regions in the, in the country. So just to give you a brief context of where we are and the context of the country. In 2019, uh, we implemented or we approved you know, the country uh, implemented, started implementing the universal health care. And as you will see in this, uh, in this slide, uh, the aspiration of universal health care is that every Filipino has access to quality, affordable health services when and where they need them without ever falling into financial health financial hardship when these are, uh, when these are uh, served. So, Health financing is very much, very much part of the universal health care implementation in the country. One of the main uh, reform uh, initiatives of the universal health care is further fiscal and local autonomy through what we call the province-wide and city-wide health systems, uh, which are provisions, actually, uh, uh, salient provisions of the universal health care in the Philippines. And the aspiration of the universal healthcare uh, implementation in the Philippines is that every Philippine, as you see here, no, the eligible, uh, uh, the, 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 the beneficiaries uh, should actually be enrolled in the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation so that they would have access to the services provided by the system. What you will see on the left are actually the building blocks no, of the health system, of which financing, again, is a very, very important component of the building blocks. But what do we have in the Philippines? We have a very fragmented uh, health system, uh, partly because of the decentralization or devolution of health services. And uh, ongoing reforms, you know, which started in 1991, is still continuing on until the moment. And what we have seen also that the Philippine economy, uh, the PHGDP per capita growth has been growing as well over the years. And the budget, you know, the, the health sector budget has been growing 
as as well over the years no uh, the 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 uh, figure on the right is what you call the national expenditure program in the philippines which showed the increasing uh, national government budget to help but we see as well that the uh, uh, private and out of pocket spending has stayed while primary preventive uh, remains the prioritized no the red line you see is actually the insurance contribution to uh, health uh, expenditure. And the yellow line actually is the household out-of-pocket expenditure. So you see a very, very slow decline in the share of, uh, of uh, uh, current health expenditure from the out-of-pocket expense, which actually we should be expecting with implementation of universal health care. What you see on the right actually, uh, what is highlighted with the yellow is actually the, the national health insurance payments to primary health care benefits in 2015 to 2020, so you will see a very low, almost zero, share of national health insurance payments to uh, primary health care uh, services during those uh, five years. So one indicator uh, that we have uh, seen or uh, that we could actually use to, to, to assess this is what we call the benefits delivery uh, rate, no. Uh, what you will see here uh, is a part of a study in in uh, it looks at the benefits benefits de delivery rate. Is that uh, if you have a target of one hundred fully protected Filipinos, data I think around uh, five years ago with the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation uh, shows that only fifty three are enrolled and eligible to file claims, and out of the fifty three that are enrolled and eligible to file claims, only twenty two avail of the benefits in accredited hospital. And out of the 22, only eight actually receive services. So in terms of benefits delivery rate, only eight Filipinos are fully protected by the National Health Insurance Program prior to the universal health care implementation in 2019. So we have still a situation of uh, uh, health inequities. Uh, these are indicative of these health status indicators in more uh, 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 more advantage and less uh, and 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 less disadvantaged provinces in the Philippines. So how does financing uh, come in? What is financing? Health financing is, is a system uh, uh, of, for the mobilization, accumulation, allocation of money to cover the health needs of people individually and collectively. In the Philippines, this is through the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation, which looks into the resource mobilization, risk pooling, and resource allocation for the uh, uh, health financing needs of the of the health system the 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 objective or the the direction or as far as the framework is concerned is to generate funds to make the the best possible of use funds and of course financial accessibility for those who need them primarily the primarily the citizens and the entire Philippine health or national health insurance program is actually uh, um, uh, under the, the concept of social health insurance. So under the, the social health insurance, the scheme for mobilizing the resources through risk sharing mechanism uh, that reflects the values of solidarity and shared responsibility for healthcare. What you see at the lower part is actually the basic uh, uh, diagram or, or relationship between the insurer, the insured and the healthcare provider. And in this particular case, we are implementing, as far as the Philippine health insurance is concerned, a social health insurance uh, concept. So social health insurance is anchored in the concept of solidarity, which is best exemplified in one of the Filipino values called the uh, Bayani. And what you see on the right actually is a Filipino art artwork by Filipino national artists, which is actually a uh, 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 a description of this uh, so, so social solidarity or shared values in terms of helping each other in times of uh, need. Uh, so going now more directly in community-based insurance uh, in the Philippines, uh, this actually uh, was uh, enshrined, no? actually uh, highlighted in the universal health care law in the Philippines, wherein uh, the, 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 the goal actually is, is, is uh, universal national health insurance coverage and financial protection. However, community-based insurance in the Philippines uh, had a sort of a, a, a freeze no, around the 2010 to 2015 because of the regulatory framework for microinsurance 
in the Philippines. Now, prior to that, and even at the moment, uh, these community-based insurance are created or operate, are operational at the community level and led by local government units or national non-government organizations, cooperatives, or local institutions. And uh, and and they operate along shared values of and solidarity mechanisms across sectoral concerns. So meaning that this is not purely on 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 health. No, some are actually based on livelihood uh, initiatives, and some are based on uh, uh, sectoral, uh, for example, agricultural uh, related concerns. There are elements of microinsurance, and that and there and 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 that was part of the. In a sense, uh, 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 perhaps uh, uh, delay or slowing down of uh, community-based insurance in the Philippines, uh, because the regulation under the microinsurance sector or the insurance sector in the Philippines, however, it still has the potential to provide healthcare access to, to populations that are that is that the national health insurance program has problems in reaching. And it can provide additional benefits not covered by, by health insurance. So community-based insurance in the Philippines uh, arise from communities recognized need to provide healthcare access to populations not covered by the national health insurance program, like the informal sector workers. So uh, most community-based insurance in the Philippines do not function primarily as health insurance, but rather as an, as an extension or add-on of services offered, particularly for their particular sector, like in the case of uh, cooperatives. And communities value the services offered by CB, community CBHIs, which complement or add to benefits not covered under FEMA. For example, CBHIs can, can, can provide transportation expenses for uh, ambulance or travel to hospital, food in the hospital, and other health-related expenses, while 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 availing the, the health services. The additional role of CVHIs in the Philippines under universal health care is actually for stakeholding, with regards to sectoral representation in local health boards and also national agencies, to assist no or to support local public management of the local government units uh, management of their special health funds to provide uh, primary care resources uh, to refine community level and formal primary care provision initiatives. And uh, of course, the primary role of uh, uh, providing additional resources uh, and additional options for resource mobilization for the delivery of services at the community or local level. So with that, I would like to end my presentation in terms of sharing the, uh, the context of universal healthcare in the Philippines and how community-based health insurance in the Philippines have evolved and is evolving under universal healthcare implementation in the Philippines. Thank you and a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, so it was a very nice presentation and especially elaborating on health financing. Uh, which will be very beneficial in the rural parts, I think. So uh, we can have some questions. So is there any question to Dr. Dennis? May I have a question for Dennis? Yes. 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 Yeah, uh, I was just wondering, uh, your health uh, insurance coverage, suppose your people working in uh, overseas, you know, like uh, my country have many people work in Taiwan. So do they will also get the coverage for the insurance care? Uh, yeah, thank you for that uh, uh, question. Well, uh, what happens is that uh, if the overseas uh, Filipino workers, so for example, Filipinos working overseas, for example, in Taiwan, if they regularly pay their uh, premium contributions, to the National Health Insurance uh, Corporate uh, uh, Program, uh, they can actually uh, claim for reimbursement. For example, if they are uh, uh, hospitalized in Taiwan, they would have to pay first you know, the fees, but they can claim a certain amount for reimbursement from the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation. Uh, so. At, at the moment, that is the, the 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 level of portability that is available, social health insurance or health insurance portability that's available to members of uh, 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 Philippine Health Insurance Corporation who are overseas overseas workers. Over. Thank you.
Yes, Dr. Dennis, we also have this uh, two type of scheme, health insurance uh, that is national coverage, another is social security. Social security fund is especially for the uh, formal uh, workers and for informal workers and community, there is health insurance national. Uh, but the problem is that people are very much excited when the program comes at first, uh, but when they have to pay every year, <clears throat> then there is decrease in the number they are actually affiliated to the service scheme. So uh, what is your, the response of the community to your program? Uh, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Daya. So uh, actually we, we have a one, one for, for the, the National Health Insurance Program, there is only one scheme no, uh, for uh, all the benefits. So whether you are uh, from the uh, public sector, private sector, or even from the indigent uh, sector, uh, you actually uh, enjoy the same uh, benefits. Uh, so the, the fund is pulled, and then there is only one one set of benefits for the entire uh, for all the for all the for all the citizens. But of course, that's not always enough. So what happens is that. Uh, 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 if you are if you can afford then you could get a private uh, health insurance or an hmo or the community based health insurance uh, schemes not that i have described the community based health insurance schemes are actually local locally initiated and locally operated schemes at the local level so it could actually be a um, sort of a solidarity fund for anyone, for example, in a member of a group who uh, who actually gets sick, if you are paying your contributions, then you get a certain amount. It could also be something like a benefit that is provided by a local cooperative or a local organization or a local government, in addition to what you you will get from the national health insurance uh, benefit from the national health uh, insurance program. So it's a, some kind of a supplement. To, to what you can get, but not all communities actually have this. Very few communities, very few organizations would have this. And as I said, and as I earlier mentioned, there was actually a, a, a regulation, strict regulation from the Insurance Commission a few years back, you know, which actually slowed down the uh, development or the offering of community-based insurance corporations because they were, the, the, the government starting to treat community-based initiatives as regular insurance, uh, uh, so that there was a stricter, uh, uh, higher, higher capitalization that was required, which was difficult for a lot of these community groups. Over. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Nis. So we'll move to next uh, presenter, uh, uh, Michael Su. He will be presenting on establishing a people-centered O2O regional medical care network the case study of Nantou County, uh, Taiwan. Uh, Mr. Michael. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Please give me a minute, okay, to share my slide. Oh, where is my slide? <laughs> my, sl Sorry, my slide disappeared. Wait a minute, okay. No problem. So maybe uh, okay. it's coming. Okay, uh, it's coming. Yeah, yeah. Finally, yeah. okay. So can everybody see my slides? Yes. Yes. Can you make yes. it full screen? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And firstly, I introduce myself. I'm currently the CEO of a, a telemedicine company called uh, CUR Doctor. And uh, I'm also a founder of a, a MPO called Wise Love Alliance. Okay. The MPO is committed to improve uh, the rural health care, okay, the main mission 
for the MPO. And uh, today, okay, my honor to uh, share the case of a people-centered regional medical care network, which is a case of uh, in Nantou County in Taiwan. And firstly, I would like to share the financing structure uh, because it is a theme uh, of this seminar. And uh, we work with the government, so that government to manage the service because it's got the public power and the trust. And uh, our uh, MPO West Love Alliance will donate some fund and also, oh, sorry, and also platform. So the the way we to improve the rural health primarily is uh, using the way of digital empowerment, okay, to the local government, and uh, we also uh, seeking funds from enterprise to let them, okay, sponsor some funding to fulfill to fulfill, okay, their CSR and the ESG, okay, responsibility. So let me give you a quick brief of Nanto County. Okay. Uh, in this county, 83% okay, is mountainous. And the 21.5% of the population is over 65 years old. So it is a very typ typical Asian society. And uh, there are 1.37 doctors per 1,000 people, ranking 18th among the 22 regional regions in Taiwan. And with 0 0.6 doctors per square meter, ranking 21st. So you will see, okay, it's a, uh, uh, even in Taiwan, the uh, uh, medical resources is relatively abundant, but uh, in this county, uh, they are relatively, okay, uh, uh, it's, short, it's shortage of resources. And um, in this case, we are looking for soft loss five problems. Number one is health data is spread across various systems. Okay. Second is it's difficult for people in seeking medical treatment. The third is high transportation cost uh, and the time. The fourth is delay medical care creates more problem and also detecting disease too late also create more cost. Okay, to provide a solution, okay, we want to build a people-centered health cloud for the government. We sponsor it, donate the platform, okay, uh, which is uh, uh, ISO 27001 certified and uh, also GDPR complied. And uh, in this uh, architecture, we we let government okay to connect all the people who required care and also connect the hospitals, clinics, home care agency, and the care center. Those institutions they provide care. And uh, then we provide four different services. The first one is interactive video health education. So it's a everyday job, okay? And the second is uh, AI assisted uh, ins inspection, like uh, the physical examination, ECG, sleep, TB, and uh, uh, bone density. And the third is preventive care. We use AIoT measurement, okay, every day, and they provide active uh, care, proactive care for for those people uh, with okay abnormal uh, number, and uh, we also uh, support invite the family member to join uh, okay the care. The number four is telemedicine, okay, uh, we support the big data, the health data, okay, with AI to those uh, care institution and uh, provide uh, telemedicine doctor consultation and also uh, it's also enable 
uh, family member to join the uh, consultation. Here is the uh, solution, okay. Uh, in the user side, the APP, we provide the APP, transform the government official website into an interactive O2O service, which can store various health data, such as daily data from care centers. So in Nanto County, uh, those I A AIoT deployed in uh, 242 community care center and the link to all the hospitals and the public clinics online for online registration. And uh, so they can do either uh, online okay, uh, consultation or to do the offline treatment. Okay. Third is to link to all public free healthcare assistance. The government uh, is the right hand side. Okay, you can see uh, the the APP will provide. There are some health care service, which is free, provided by the government, and also some convenient service. Even you can arrange a, a public a, a free a bus or a transportation for you to uh, to take you to to the, take the elders, okay, to the hospitals, and. Uh, we also provide uh, uh, for the caregiver APP. The main function, the main function is to support the mobility uh, for those caregivers and uh, also support cross agency collaboration. So it's a uh, as a people centered okay uh, service. And the last one is the management platform, which is supports managing third parties, uh, personnel and the staffs. So not only your own organization's personnel, but also including uh, the third parties personnel, which has B2B uh, cooperation with uh, your organization. And uh, we provide the, the real-time report, including the third party staff. So which is a, a very brief introduction about uh, the uh, this case in Nanto, and uh, thank you, and uh, welcome. Any question? Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Michael. So, is there any question for Mr. Michael? Yeah, uh, thank you for your nice presentation, Michael. And uh, no doubt, Nanto County is a very successful case. Besides that, do you have any other plans to go to other place in Taiwan? Yeah, we have a uh, signing cooperation agreement with three okay county, and uh, we are working on the number four and the number five right now to duplicate the the experience and the model okay to the other counties in Taiwan. That's wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you please uh, stop sharing so that we can prepare the next one? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my question to Mr. Michael is like with this, uh, this is a very good model of this people centered uh, medical care. So, has it uh, uh, have you measured about the healthcare cost that it has saved by this model, or will it be more costly, or will it save the cost, healthcare cost? Yeah, actually, it saved a lot of cost for the government and also for the people uh, in Nanto County, okay, because uh, they can save the transportation cost and uh, uh, improve the accessibility and uh, also uh, uh, the healthcare quality for them uh, through O2O uh, model. Okay, thank you. Uh, next uh, presentation is by Dr. Yerhu uh, Gazewski. He's the Director of Research at RCSI, Institute of Global Surgery. Surgery is a 
health sociologist with over 20 years of research. Uh, today, he was a bit busy and couldn't be present. So he has sent uh, the video of his pre presentation. We are going to play uh, the video of his presentation. Thank you. Uh, the video, can you see the video? Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Jakub Gajewski. I am a research program director at the Institute of Global Surgery in the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And now today I'll be presenting some of our findings on financing surgery in rural settings based on our experience from Africa. But before I get to tell you more about our findings about financing, I'd like to set the scene about surgical care and ask the question, why should we care about surgical care? Some of you might have heard that the Lancet Commission Global Surgery have established that 5 billion people globally have no access to safe surgery, and this is primarily in low and middle income countries all over the world. If we look at the sub-Saharan African continent or an African continent, outcomes of surgery are also not great compared to the rest of the world. Twice as many die in Africa after surgery. This is, these are the highlights of a study published in the Lancet recently. Also, at the policy level, surgery must be a core part of healthcare, even in the poorest countries. However, surgery is very poorly prioritized in national government healthcare plans currently. It is also very important to acknowledge that surgery, surgically treatable conditions kill more people than tuberculosis, malaria, and HIV AIDS combined. However, surgery so far has seen little attention from the politicians, from the political uh, establishment. Also, this is not just a phenomenon that is specifically to specific to Africa. As you can see from this highlight from an Indian newspaper, India, which is quite representative in the, in the Asian continent. Surgical care in India is also a neglected part of public health, which is similar to many low and middle income countries all over the world. Just to give you a bit of a background about how surgery looks like in Sub-Saharan Africa, and the, what is the population profile of Sub-Saharan Africa, 60%, 63% actually of population on the African continent south of Sahara lives in rural areas where district level hospitals are the main providers of healthcare services. District hospitals are where the people are, which is in the districts in the rural areas of the continent. When it comes to surgical workforce, the situation is very bad. There are only around 1,700 surgeons for a population of nearly 320 million of Sub-Saharan Africans. And this equates to half a surgeon per 100,000 people, which is, just to compare it to Ireland, 26 times less than in Ireland. District-level surgery is provided by non-specialists. There are mainly non-physician clinicians or medical doctors with no formal training in surgery. But surgery goes on even without the specialists. Now moving to the cost of surgery. I'd like to say at the beginning up front, surgery is expensive. We looked at how much surgery cost as a proportion of the total hospital annual budget and across three countries, Malawi, Zambia, and Tanzania, where we worked, surgery and in a district hospital consumes up to 40% of a total annual hospital budget, which is quite a lot. And also unit cost for surgery is quite expensive. And I'll show you the data uh, very shortly. I, will, I would like to also highlight that there is a general underutilization of existing capacity at district level, which has consequences for the cost of surgical services in those facilities. These are some of the papers that I would like to highlight. The cost of providing district level surgery in Malawi, the provision of surgery and scaling up of surgery in Zambia, and also economic cost of, provision of the surgical provision 
in Tanzania, which I'll be sharing the data from. First of all, our study in Malawi have compared three district level hospitals in terms of how much does it cost to perform a single surgical procedure in those hospitals. We looked at cesarean section, evacuation from uterus and hernia procedure, and we have Mangochi, Mulanje and Sanje district hospitals. And what we can see on this slide that there is a big difference in price, the prices are in dollars between these hospitals. So a cesarean section in Mangochi is $164, while a cesarean section in Sanje is $638. The difference also is in hernia procedure, $137 versus nearly $600, and evacuation from uterus, $57 in Mangochi, $143, which is nearly three times more. The difference is because Nsanje underutilizes the surgical capacity, which means that they have the theater, they have the staff, the equipment that, that to conduct essential surgical basic surgeries. However, they don't do as much as they should be doing to bring the cost down. So every single case that they do is higher because there is a lot of idle time of staff. Mangochi, however, on the other hand side, is a very productive, very efficient hospital. They do quite a lot of surgeries. So the staff, staff's time, which is one of the most expensive cost drivers, is utilized efficiently. Therefore, the cost per procedure is higher. So underutilization of capacity leads to increased cost of surgical provision. Our second study, I think, is very interesting. It compared district level surgical services, the cost in US dollars between district level hospital and a general hospital. We have Mamba district and Livingston General Hospital. And then we can see that in, this, in, the, in the case of cesarean section, there is a 700, the red column, there's a $700 different difference between Mamba and Livingston, $271 difference in the cost between Mamba and Livingston in evacuation of uterus. Uh, nearly $600 in a hernia repair. So if we do 10 hernia, if we manage not to refer hernias from a district level hospital to a central hospital, we save $600. Apart from the cost of referrals, we save $600 just on, in the actual cost of the procedure. So the overall message from the slide is district hospital services are often cheaper for the system than surgical similar surgical services in a general hospital when it costs when it comes to essential surgical services this is also very important to to acknowledge bringing it again to asia i found a study that had similar findings in india if we look at the cost in rupees of a cesarean section we can see that the district hospital is significantly cheaper it's 1,729 rupees per cesarean section than a charitable hospital, which is, I, I, I think it equates to a missionary hospital in, in sub-Saharan Africa or a private teaching hospital, which has 6,434 rupees per cesarean section, which means, you know, that again, the district hospital services are quite cheap compared to the other ones. We also wanted to look at what are the financial mechanisms for surgery. What do we know about financing surgical services in Sub-Saharan Africa? So we conducted a finance, uh, scoping review, looking at the different mechanisms and, and evidence so far. The highlights of this study are that, first of all, there are severe challenges in terms of financing surgical services across Sub-Saharan Africa because of constrained fiscal space for health, which translates into there is not enough finance, there is not enough money in the healthcare system to finance surgery adequately. But this is also because there is, like I said at the beginning, poor political prioritization of surgery. Surgery hardly ever appears in the national healthcare strategic plans as a priority. Therefore, there is not uh, there, there, are, there are no, no uh, dedicated budget lines, particularly in rural settings. I forgot to mention before that in the, at, at the district level, in the three countries where we work, surgery 
did not have a ring fence budget line at the district level hospital, which means that the hospital's annual budget as received by a hospital did not have a, sep a separate budget for surgical services, yet the cost of surgery was up to 40% of the actual budget. So the resources for surgery were being pulled from other uh, budget lines in the overall hospital annual grant. From our, from, our, from our rate review, we've also learned that because there are severe, shortages, severe financial shortages, hospitals have difficulties to provide the full service package or to scale up services. They are running at a loss a lot of times, and they are not able to do more because they have no finance for it. And this, in turn, translates into challenges for people to access services. Surgical services are unaffordable for the great majority of populations, and if people access surgery, this often results in a catastrophe and impoverishment because there are no financial protection mechanisms for surgical services in sub-Saharan Africa. Therefore, moving forward, I think what we need to be doing is to identify there is a need to develop trial studies to identify financial mechanisms for district hospitals to identify mechanisms that work globally. Maybe during this session, there will be some knowledge to share about what works, what doesn't work. And I think we need to put more research, more. we need to find out how best to finance surgical services because in rural settings, because like I said at the beginning, in Sub-Saharan Africa, but also in other many other low and, mean, low and middle income countries in the world, people are in the districts. They want to be operated on close to home. They want to have services close to home yet district hospitals and lower level hospitals they are not adequately financed and surgery is not prioritized in those health uh, in those uh, settings so i think this concludes my presentation unfortunately i cannot be with you so if you have any questions please send me an email thank you very much for your attention enjoy the rest of the session oh, thank you it was really a nice presentation uh, especially being a surgeon, I'm really interested in this financing in uh, global surgery context. So our next presentation will be by Dr. Yang Yi Cho. Uh, he is a cardiothoracic surgeon from Samsung Medical Center, uh, San Kyung Kwang University of Medicine. Dr. Yang. Uh, hello. Uh, Let me yes. share my slide. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for kind introduction. As I told you, I'm working as a cardiac surgeon at Samsung Medical Center, Seoul, Korea. Um, uh, I made my company about two, two and a half years ago, uh, mainly focusing on kind of telemedicine monitoring in heart failure patients. Um, as a cardiac surgeon, I'm more focused uh, on heart failure surgery, such as transplant, uh, ventricular assist device, uh, venous artery or ECMO, et cetera. So uh, I came to be interested in uh, heart failure uh, patient, especially quite advanced heart failure. And then as you, most of you know, already know, uh, this is the curve of, uh, a clinical course of heart failure. So heart failure, uh, unlike uh, cancer, cancer just uh, uh, goes like this, but heart, heart failure quite works in me. Uh, when this slope down, patient frequently uh, come to emergency room and uh, hospitalized. Sometimes patient just die, uh, cannot, recover from their uh, acute episode of uh, heart failure. So this well-known monitoring these patients, uh, telemonitoring, the home monitoring of these patients are quite important and then have to prevent uh, this kind of acute exacerbation. So I came to be interested in uh, home monitoring of those patients. So quickly, I made uh, my company, I decided to make some kind of device because uh, we have blood pressure measurement device, we have uh, 
pulse oximetry, we have ECG, we have this type of uh, uh, wearable uh, devices, but all those are not uh, well designed for home monitoring or telemonitoring. So I decided to make a kind of uh, multifunctional printer or a printer which has a fax function uh, and scanner function and printer function, something like that. Uh, not a rocket science. I just decided to uh, design a device having a multifunction, as you can see here. So this device has uh, ECG. Uh, as you can see, there is a metal lead here and there. There is three, three lead. And then it also has a uh, uh, pulse oximetry, uh, PPG sensor here, I turn it on. And then because we have a, a PPG sensor, we automatically know, able to know pulse rate or heart rate, uh, whether it comes from uh, ECG or pulse oximetry. Um, and then it has uh, uh, electronic stethoscope, it has a diaphragm here, then it has a microphone inside so that it kind of able to am amplify the sound it can sense from uh, wherever. Uh, it can be a hard sound, it can be bow sound, it can be long sound wherever you put it on. Put it on. And it also has a thermometer, uh, uh, near thermo uh, thermometer here. So, and then the design is, uh, is uh, checking this vital side mostly at the same time. So like this, I will show later, you can grab like this, you can put finger here, uh, you can check ECG and PPG at the same time. Uh, if you put this on the chest or belly wherever, it measure the sound where it put it on and then able to check the skin temperature at the same time, something like that. So this is not well developed yet. I just made the second version of uh, my device. Is there any problem in my... So, uh, so we are under, uh, right now we are gathering uh, patient's data, especially having a heart failure patient, their ECG and PPG and vital sign, cardiac output, et cetera. Uh, trying to uh, uh, analyze uh, the big data from the Samsung Medical Center heart failure patients and then uh, trying to developing AI uh, estimation or prediction uh, of their uh, cardiac output, blood pressure, and then acute exacerbation thing. Uh, see on the development. Um, this is not the only device uh, doing that kind of thing. Uh, the one CheckMe Pro is kind of our uh, prototype, uh, our model, benchmark model. Somebody may already saw this uh, CheckMe Pro. It's a very small uh, kind of patient monitor, has in most of the sensor, PPG sensor is here. It also has an ECG lead here and there. It has uh, this thing. Uh, and it, it is able to connect you to blood pressure uh, device, uh, blood pressure medicine device too. And then there is a, a few more devices uh, called Taito Care and Nonagon. This is from Israel, this is from US. We think so you probably you all know this brand name of uh, We think uh, mainly making this uh, wearable watch. Uh, but they made it this kind of bar thing, uh, able to check uh, ECG and PPG, et cetera. So our one is uh, more flexible, uh, designed to be flexible, has a both Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, and then able to work independently without a smartphone like this. So as you can see, uh, Widings one and Nonagon one, uh, this is essential, you have a smartphone plus a app, uh, but my one just uh, able to work independently. And but thing is still under development. So I just skip this. Uh, AIM is uh, kind of able to triage patient, whether patient is critical condition or is uh, 
uh, just uh, we can be observed this pipe, this patient, etc. So this is usability comparison as I showed before. This is AR prediction, what we are currently doing. We are gathering heart failure patient ECG and PPG blood pressure and cardiac output from Soangan's thermodilution and trying to estimate uh, from ECG or PPG of their cardiac output. Still underdeveloped. So detailed uh, design of uh, my device. And this is what we are using. Uh, grab like this. Uh, as you can see, uh, PPG sensor automatically activated. Still filter is not very good. As you can see, kind of ECG is coming out. You can see the pulse. So uh, let me conclude uh, what is our plan. Uh, so we need to further develop. This is second version of uh, experimental model of our device. Uh, we have just this device. We actually, for the first version, we developed a system for healthcare professional, professionals uh, able to see and gathering patient data from this device uh, to the cloud. Amazon Cloud, but for the second version, uh, we uh, because short of money, we just made this device, and uh, we have to develop early warning system using AI and other mathematical model, and we also have to mass pro, uh, need to mass production of this. Uh, we will use uh, 3D printing uh, in order to make uh, many device in a lower cost. And then we actually, this is something uh, I get to hear. Um, I'm looking for a test bed. Uh, I think uh, Nepal and uh, other South Asian country is uh, perfect, should be perfect uh, test bed for our device. And then we're going to use this device in my hospital and then other um, tertiary Korean hospital as well. And then, um, as I mentioned, we short of money. Uh, I really want to get money from Koika or Korean venture capitals. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yang. So it was really a nice presentation and this device, uh, I think it will be very useful, especially for remote uh, monitoring. Uh, and for the country like Nepal, it would be very much beneficial. Uh, so hope, hope we can have further program for this. Uh, is there any question for Dr. Yang? So if uh, there is no question, then we'd like to move forward. Uh, there is another presentation from Andy Bladen. Uh, he is Communities Director from ECH Alliance in the Global Health Connector. He is trying to uh, establish a ecosystem, digital health ecosystem, and we have been working together. Uh, uh, he is also he is from UK, England, and uh, uh, today also he couldn't be present and has sent this recorded video. Now we are going to play that. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the introduction. My name's Andy Bleeden. I work for the ECH Alliance, the Global Health Connector. Um, and we're pleased to take part in today's session on rural health healthcare. Uh, what I want to try and do is give a little bit of an insight about who we are, but also give some practical examples where across our network, we see successful adoption and implementation of rural healthcare. Just for those people who don't know who we are, I'll share a couple of just, just pieces of information with you, which hopefully will give you an idea about the type of network we've got, 
but also where that network is and, um, and how you can get involved. So as the Global Health Connector, East Age Lions have been since 2012, building up a network of over 1100 organizations across the globe. And we bring those together in a network of 80 different ecosystems, okay, in different locations. And some of them um, you'll be aware of, some of them you won't be. And the idea behind that is based on an idea that in healthcare, we got this particular two problems. One is that healthcare, unlike finance or um, fintech, etc., which are global, healthcare is kind of national and, and everything has to be reinvented from nation to nation, sometimes from region to region as well. And because of that, we, we've got this particular problem of trying to reinvent the wheel. And healthcare is also very, very siloed. So there's many, many silos in healthcare, which I'm sure you're all part of in, in, in your um, countries as well. And no one country holds a, a moral mandate on this. So it's as bad as in, in the UK where I used to work, as it is in say Australia or the US or across the African continent. So we bring our members together in these ecosystems to do four things. We connect them, we can bring them together, we amplify what they do, and we accelerate what our members do. You'll see my contacts down here where you can contact me if you wanna reach out and find out more about that. But just so I wanna touch with you so you understand what we mean by ecosystems, because a lot of people write a lot of stuff about ecosystems, certainly academics, don't wish to offend anyone here. But for us, it's quite a basic concept because ecosystems are there to match need and solution. They bring all the stakeholders together, uh, of health together in what we call permanent multi-stakeholder gatherings on topics that are decided by the local ecosystem or the national ecosystem as being a priority. And then use an idea where we bring first the need uh, and then the solution and see where we can collaborate. So that might be on a topic like diabetes and um, we bring along the need for patient organizations who want to understand what solutions and services are there for people with recent diagnosis of type 2 diabetes for instance healthcare professionals in terms of information they need or solutions or services as well as companies wanting to understand more policy makers who might need to understand trends and researchers who need to have access to data they all are permanently wonderful um, organizations, of course, but they work in silos and very, very rarely do they co collaborate and communicate to each other. So we bring those need organizations together and then we flip it on its head and say, OK, well, what does good look like in this country, in this region? Um, Where's their best practice, best pieces of research, decent policies, peer education programs, etc. Again, all of those organizations, very laudable, but very often work in silos. So we bring those together and then connect them with the need to break down silos, transform healthcare delivery. And by that, I mean actually do stuff as opposed to talking about doing stuff. But also because healthcare is such a large area of spend to create economic growth. So we've developed a network of these ecosystems across all the countries you can see here. Uh, we're rapidly expanding in the US now and also in Africa, uh, building up a network of ecosystems across the whole of the continent of, of Africa uh, with partners from Africa CDC. And we're looking to expand that network. So if you're interested in finding out more, more about that, please also connect with us. Because this network is vital because it's both an implementation network, okay, for getting things done across the globe, but also as an intelligence network. So we've got connections there in the ground, on the ground, real connections, whether it's in Slovenia um, or, for instance, in Chile or Croatia or Turkey, who can have that vital role in making connections where you might be wanting to, to do collaborative pieces of work. We also bring those coordinators together of all these ecosystems and see where we can co collaborate better, whether it's in projects, uh, whether that's in the EU, the US, Africa, etc., or indeed on further areas of collaboration. We've also established a series of 
thematic ecosystems which are cross-border in nature and cover such areas as cancer or women's health. Recently, we've been exploring the area of rural health as part of our ecosystem on digital health data, which is vital to understand how different countries target those people that are hardest to reach, either physically or politically. Two different necessarily re re reasons, but also quite important. So for instance, on the topic of cancer, we've been able to bring best practice from Latin America, the US, Europe, the WHO, Africa, and also Turkey. I mention Africa and Turkey because very often we see a very westernized approach to cancer care. But within Africa, we could showcase best practice around state-led public health measures that would leave many in Europe absolutely amazed by the impact of those public health programs and at a fraction of the cost of some of our failed health programs. So that's a, an example of how we work. Uh, we're also getting involved with a number of, of global events. So we're going to be at Health, HRTH in Las Vegas. We're interested in finding out more about that. Scan that code on the screen with your phones now. Um, we're building a global village there as part of the uh, largest health uh, ecosystem session across the whole of the US. Brilliant organisation. Uh, and find out more using that link and get involved and contact with me. You can also subscribe to our newsletter. It's free. Um, and if you're interested, uh, you can also become a member to scan the code on the right here. Use the because this is how you can get in, get involved with our network and uh, hopefully uh, find out more about how to connect up with those other ecosystems. So that's enough about us. Let's go back to talk about how we work with some of those different countries um, around the area of rural health and particularly as finance, because finance is the missing missing key that helps with the delivery of rural healthcare. And I'll give you three examples. And if I've got time, luckily, maybe a fourth one as well. So we've brought together, for instance, um, within Spain, we've got a unique ecosystem that tackles the area of rural healthcare, whether it's adult social care or mental health care or dealing with dementia, but particularly in a very rural and remote region within Spain. That's a very good example of where the state or the region has taken a lead role in financing and delivering rural health care. And if you're interested in finding out more about that, contact me, andy at echalliance.com, and we'll connect you up with our ecosystem network in Spain to find out more about how that's delivered. Particularly the work they've done around working with older people as many of the younger people have exited that region to move to the cities, it's become depopulated and also very much more remote as many of the transport links have gone that came with that larger population. And what we've been able to do is connect up that ecosystem with other rural ecosystems, whether it's in Greece um, or perhaps in, in, in Bulgaria and Romania, to see how they approach the issue of dealing around financing rural health care, whether that's using money from the recently released uh, regeneration and renewal funds from the European Commission, or indeed bending some of that mainstream funding from local government to target their most remote and hard to reach. Because very often in those communities, that population actually costs the most. Because what happens then is they are the least um, to get access to primary care, the least to get transitional care that's consistent, and they're more likely to turn up at the more expensive end of healthcare. So it's in the region's interest to maintain their position in the community and keep them out of formal healthcare for as long as possible. So the finance cost, if they don't, is really prohibitive. So it's much cheaper to, to invent to invest further in the front of uh, the, the program uh, to prevent further costs further down the line. So that's an example from Spain uh, and a brilliant organization of Fundesulud has been uh, leading on that piece of work. 
And if you're interested, I've got a recording of one of the ecosystems we've done on that, which is in English. So it's, it's um, although the participants spoke in, in English. Second, I want to then um, move across the globe and, and talk about some of the work where our ecosystems are working in Zimbabwe. So in Zimbabwe, uh, the, the need there is for the delivery of remote hospital care in areas that are physically hard to get to and physically hard to develop and build what we would class as the built hospital environment. So much of this hospital provision has to be delivered remotely because there is no first option. The delivery isn't there elsewhere. So we're working with our Zimbabwean ecosystem who are looking for both solutions, funders and, inv and, and, and investments from outside and within Africa uh, to, to get involved with Zimbabwe and seek to deliver the delivery of new remote hospital provision using the best methodologies. And they've approached and, and worked with colleagues from say Norway or the US for some, some collaborative work there. But also, most importantly, from across Africa, because Africa, as we know, is a very, very large continent, and there's a lot of progressive work around rural and remote healthcare actually being delivered. Because in Africa, what we find within our network is there's a much easier approach to public-private partnership that we don't see as often in some of our other networks. And then the third example I want to give you, because I want to make time for, for all our speakers today, is to look at the rural and remote healthcare delivered in Scotland. Uh, so in Scotland, obviously, it's a, you know, a small country within the UK, uh, but a lot of that population live in relatively remote and rural areas that have been traditionally too far away from mainstream healthcare provision uh, because they're either separated by a large landmass, or indeed by sea barrier. So there are many highlands, uh, highland areas that are hard to reach and, and to get to, and also islands off of Scotland, and some significant distance away from Scotland, which if you become ill, you need to get access to uh, healthcare in an emergency, can mean rapid transport, either by helicopter, which is very, very expensive, or indeed, using uh, traditional services such as ferries and, and, and buses and rail, which can add days to journey times for people accessing hospital treatment. So <clears throat> in, in Scotland, they rolled out a very successful program called NHS Near Me, using one of our members' solutions, which is a video consultation service, before the pandemic, to understand how we could best deliver healthcare in remote communities, but without the cost of building new facilities. So they've undertaken a number of different activities using video consultation in small rural locations that allow people to access hospital triage services, hospital consultations by video, using perhaps the local post office or the local pub or uh, a church building, and get access to consultants, access to to that first level of uh, what I would class as healthcare, but without the distance and without the travelling involved, which enables them both to save their own time and money in travelling, but also means that hospital clinicians can see more patients more rapidly during that pace of the day. And that programme has been rolled out nationally through, through the pandemic. And half after the pandemic has, been, has stayed there because the cost savings there are enormous. And we've seen successful programmes like across Scotland, but also with radiology um, provision across Scotland as well, delivered again in some of the highlands and islands areas that traditionally would never have access to the ability to be able to provide radiology because of cost and the, and the, the barriers to that. So some really good examples there within Scotland. Again, want to find out about them or our ecosystem in Zimbabwe or indeed our ecosystem in or some of our ecosystems in Spain. Get in touch with me. More importantly, I always think about this as, as a, and I'll leave you with this thought, there's the so what bit. What does this mean for us? Uh, whether you're perhaps there in Islamabad or in Nepal, I know we've got colleagues from Nepal there. 
What does this mean for us in terms of collaboration? How can we get involved with this? Well, I'm looking to build a network of thematic ecosystems all the time. And I'm always looking for best practice from other regions. So if you've got successful practice in this area around rural healthcare, and particularly the financing, let me know, because we can share that with other countries. That's important because for goodness sake, we've got to stop reinventing the wheel and get back to doing healthcare as opposed to talking about healthcare. Okay, I'm gonna pass you back. Hopefully you've caught up some time from the people who've overrun before, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the program. My name's Andy Bleeden. Don't forget, you can reach out to me at andy at echalliance.com or contact Udaya here, who will give you my contact directly. Thank you very much. Look forward to speaking to you. Thank you, thank you. So it was very nice presentation. And with that, we are concluding the presentations. Uh, but here are some important persons that uh, we'd like to hear from. Uh, Mr. Chiang Chichuan from Taiwan. So we'd like to hear from you some, some of your insights in health financing. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh... Uh, Dr. Udaya, yeah, I'm I'm driving, so I'm not coming oh, in and talk too much. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Um, but uh, okay. I'm very pleased to join this session and uh, looking forward to to meet you all in the future online, on site, in person. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Chang, for participating. Uh, here is Dr. Moriyama. So, uh, please uh, uh, put on your view about the health financing. Uh, thank you for organizing this very inter um, quite interesting session. Uh, so the health insurance system is a quite complicated in each country, same in Japan, actually. So, but without financing, we can do nothing, actually, as a medication. So it's a quite a big issue for each country. And also each have, each country have a very, uh, each pro program, programs also. So that's why the we should think about more and more to save the patient, especially in rural uh, area. So thank you for organizing these interesting sessions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moriyama. Uh, here is Dr. Razan Parazuli uh, from Nepal Research and Education Network and Telemedicine Society. Dr. Razan. Okay. Uh... Thank you, Uday, sir. Uh, yes, regarding the health financing, uh, yeah, it is a very important component. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to have a different uh, approaches for this uh, when the delivering healthcare services in uh, rural areas as well. As uh, there is a disparities uh, between uh, urban areas and rural areas. So uh, uh, I think we need to consider the, this uh, rural sectors as a, from, from the different perspectives. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, that, that's the thing I want to tell. So uh, nothing much. Uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful sessions and uh, your all the efforts to make it uh, very successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pawan Sakhe from ICT 4D and Television Society. Mr. Pawan. Yeah, thank you, Dr. De uh, uh, We We had a wonderful session. Uh, I think, uh, as uh, the previous speaker said, uh, health financing scheme is obviously a very much a challenge in countries like ours, especially in the rural area. But I think like with the effective collaboration with international and national partners, uh, we can achieve uh, a few steps in terms of providing effective and affordable healthcare services in the rural areas. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so is there any question to any presenter? If you have any queries or comments, please, you can share.
Yes. Uh, if not, then uh, with uh, Mr. Michael. Uh, Mr. Michael, do you know about this Truchi Foundation in Taiwan? Uh, you, you mean what? A bigger part of uh, it? There, there is a foundation called Truchi. Truchi or Truchi Foundation? Chu, oh, Truchi. Truchi Foundation. Yes. Yeah. We are also working with the, the their hospitals, okay, oh. in uh, in uh, in the county, in in one of the county, I am right now, uh, signing the uh, the cooperation agreement with the government, because they are really interested to work in uh, uh healthcare in Nepal, so there are some uh, some people from Tutsi Foundation. Is it yes. or Tutsi? Yeah. Because we call we call Chi, <laughs> so uh -huh. so I, like I didn't know how to uh, pronounce. But they are actually interested to work in rural parts of uh, Nepal. Uh, so maybe we can have connection with that foundation. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. So so if you have connection, please uh, we can suggest. And with that, if we. We don't, if anyone doesn't have any comments, uh, we can end the session. And thank you all for making it a very successful uh, session. Uh, hope to see you in the next Afghan meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next one will be held in Tokyo. See you in Japan. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, see you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.